All right, welcome back. With Lock and Wiley, Eric Mangini is back with us. Let's move to Tom Brady. Eric Mangini is back with us. Let's move to Tom Brady, who sparked a number of rumors last week as a report broke that his $40 million Boston home had just hit the market. The news had people speculating that Brady was ready for retirement or even planning to find a new team next season. But the quarterback says it's all much ado about nothing. I certainly hope my, he shouldn't read into anything. I mean, I think it's, you know, it takes a long time to sell a house. I don't know if you guys, my house is a little bit of expensive one, so it doesn't <laughs> quite, you know, fly off the shelf in a couple of weeks. There's no point in worrying about things like that because they're just, there's, there's so many what ifs and hypotheticals and this and that and this and that. If you spend all your time and energy on those things, you miss track of what's really most important, which is what's happening right now. And, you know, that's this is where I want to be. This is, you know, this is the team that I want to be a part of and leading, and, and uh, I'm really excited about doing that. And there's really not much more to read into it than that. All right. Tom insisted several times that he still hopes to play until age 45 mm -hmm. in that same interview. However, I hear all of this as this is Tom Brady's final season, and he's prepared for that. He hopes to play until he's 45, but... I think he's preparing for this to be his last season. I didn't hear that. Uh, I heard a lot of my coaches who used to always say, don't get bored with success. And it, that doesn't land properly when you're an active player all the time. You hear, like, what do you mean, don't get bored with success? And that was a way that they really wanted us to just focus in on the process, on the fundamentals, and the things that you are supposed to do the right way, which at times get tedious, and at times, let's be real, get boring. You want to get creative. You want to get flex. You want to get funky with it. You want to get outside the playbook and do your own thing. He's like, don't get bored with success. And Tom Brady just gave us an enlightenment to his genius and his process. So meticulous. And it's boring. So what we do is we speculate. Confirmation bias. If you think it's over for Brady, ha-ha, you put your house on the market. Ah, we see it. And if you don't think it's over for him, you're like, oh, no franchise tag. He's going to go somewhere else. It's whatever you want to do with it. But this dude just took us deep into a place that has really contributed to all his success. And what I heard from it is a guy who was saying one day at a time, one play at a time, one year at a time, and then at that time, I'll tell you what's next. It's not for everybody, but it's for Brady. Yeah, Marcellus has nailed it. And, and one of the greatest gifts that Bill Belichick has is the ability to get a group and to get individuals to focus on the task at hand a, at the moment. And he'd always say, look, you can't worry about the past because there's nothing you can do about it. You can't change it. He said, you can't worry about the future. You're not Nostradamus. You don't know what's going to happen. So the only thing that you can control is this moment right now. And Tom's been with Bill for a long, long time, and he's heard that message over and over again, and he truly believes in that, and, and that's how he lives. Him putting his house on the market, it is. It's an expensive house. There aren't that many buyers. You need to get on the market because it's not going to sell right away if you're eventually going to move. And 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 I don't think there's anything deeper to that than, than what he talked about in the Men's Health article, where his wife grew up in a very untraditional way. It wasn't you go to this school and you live in this town and then you go to a high school and then you go to college. They, she lived all over the world. So there, there may be some, some fusion of, of, of lifestyles here in terms of what they are going to do in the future with their family and, and, and their approach. All right, Eric, mm -hmm. you've been a head coach. Take us organizationally, though. Help me understand why they agreed to a contract that lets him walk after this season. No franchise tag, no transition tag. Why that? Why shouldn't I read something into that? Because they're at the point right now where every year is a one-year deal. <laughs> and, and it doesn't mean that they're looking to get rid of him, and it doesn't mean that he's looking to leave. But the best way for them to operate is for them to each have the ability to make that decision at the end of the year. And, and it works well from a salary cap perspective, it works well from a leverage perspective for Tom Brady. So each year they can go into a new set of negotiations based off of where the previous year was and work off those one-year contracts and set it up any way that they want to set it up to help the salary cap out. To me, it shows incredible self-awareness as a great player, maybe the GOAT of all time, and an organization. They're being real. 
Who doesn't want to sit across from someone at the negotiation table and while you're talking, they have that self-awareness? Look, I am 42. I get it. I'm not going to try and take advantage of you and say, sign me for three more years. Who knows where that cliff is and I'm going to fall off it or not? And at the flip side, they're saying, look, Tom, we appreciate your services. But there's a part of this organization that has to prepare for post-Tom Brady. And we want to be able to do that and be fluid in that moment. So they're like, all right, let's just take a year by year. I, I eat what I kill, and I will just go out there and keep killing. Well, the other part of, of Bill Belichick's gift set is his, his ruthless ability to move on from players, regardless of, <laughs> of who they are. And I was just at the Hall of Fame induction, and Richard Seymour was there, and Deion Branch, and there. Uh, who else was there? Rodney Harrison was there. Ty Law. Law. Lawyer Malloy was there. Ty Law. All those guys were there. All great Patriots. All built the, the, the Patriot way and all moved on from <laughs> when it became the best interest of the team. And, and that may sound like it's way too harsh, but that's what's allowed them to compete year in and year out, and that's a real strength that he has. I made the argument last week that as much as Belichick believes in the Patriot way, so does Tom Brady, and that Tom Brady is self-aware and confident enough to say, hey, look, if it could happen to Richard Seymour, if it could happen to Ty Law, it could happen to me. Yeah, it can, it can happen to anyone, <laughs> and, and that also may be part of what drives him constantly. When you know, and, and Jerry Rice used to talk about that all the time, even at the height of his greatness, he used to feel like he was going to get cut every day, or, or he talked about training with that perspective. Well, with Tom's situation, it's real. Like, if he comes back and he's not the guy that, that they hope he is, they're going to look to move on, even though he is Tom Brady. All right, before we go, I'd like to address the major challenge facing Miami Dolphins rookie head coach Brian Flores. He will not be judged or treated fairly by the American sports media or a handful of the players on his roster. Liberals in the media and a select few black players on the Dolphins roster will penalize Flores with a black tax. It has already begun. Last week, Dolphins receiver Kenny Stills tweeted criticism of Dolphins owner Stephen Rouse for hosting a re-election fundraiser for Donald Trump. I don't have a problem with Stills using social media to question his boss. But I don't work for Stephen Ross. If I did, if I were in Flores' shoes, I'd have a problem. A major one. Stephen Ross is one of three NFL owners who employs a black head coach in 2019. Other than starting quarterback, being an NFL head coach is probably the most coveted job in all of sports. The job pays exceptionally well. It gives the coach an amazing platform to, imp to impact the careers of his assistants. If he's successful, Flores could be the next Tony Dungy and create a coaching tree of the next wave of black head coaches. Stephen Ross is an owner of several businesses, and his highest profile employee is Brian Flores. No one should be surprised or upset that Flores advised Steeles to speak privately with Ross about his political donations. The only reason Flores' advice is controversial is because Flores is black and the liberals in the media want to enforce a policy that all black people must agree with their exaggerated narrative about our current president. Deadspin, which has employed one token black writer in its 13-year history, published a piece, published pieces attacking Flores and Ross, who, know, who knows what Flores thinks of Trump. But given the enormity of the job Ross bestowed Flores, doesn't it make sense for Flores to be loyal to Ross in the first six months of holding said job? Human beings are far more complex than the way they're being painted in the modern American media. The people drawing lines in the sand and assigning good guys and bad guys are the all-knowing supremacists. They're better and smarter than I am. I'm simple. I want Brian Flores to be successful. The liberal mainstream media allegedly care about the NFL giving black coaches more opportunities to elevate the head coach. I use the word allegedly because I don't believe they care. I believe it's a smokescreen, a convenient tool the media use to paint NFL ownership as racist and fool players into obeying media commands. Flores is no fool. He's loyal to the person invested in his success. That's not the media, Kenny Stills, or the president, Stephen Ross. More speak for yourself after this.